Walden part two, which will include essays from seventh onward. Well, if you have seen Walden part one, in that we covered essays from one to six. There are total 18 essays in this book. A little bit about the introduction again. Walden, you know, is the autobiographical narrative of Henry David Thoreau. In the spring of 1845, basically, Thoreau built himself a small cabin next to the Walden Pond. On a plot of land belonging to his friend and another American author, Rolf Waldo Emerson. Emerson permitted Thoreau to use his property in return for improving the land by plantation. So Thoreau lived there near the Walden Pond, near a tent and a boat away from the city life exactly for two years, two months and two days. But the action of the book is discussed in one calendar year. That is, it begins and ends with spring chronologically. Okay. Abhi, before you see this, now kindly go and see Walden part one. This is Hina from Team Walat. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Let's start with essay number seven, The Bean Field. What happens? During his first summer at Walden Pond, Thoreau plants a two and a half acre plot with beans and other vegetables. While planting beans, Thoreau wonders, what shall I learn of beans or beans of me? Which means he's actually personifying beans as humans. He's saying, what will I learn of beans or what will beans learn of me? Why am I working so hard in cultivating beans? Why am I making the earth say beans instead of grass? Since, according to Thoreau, the beans are so dull and practical, whereas wild flowers that grow wildly and naturally in the forest, they are so vibrant. He questions himself, he answers himself. The answers that he gives are, first, hard manual labor benefits the soil because he is tilling and he is putting the, you know, bean seeds inside. This will help the soil also, okay? The fertility of the soil. And also, it benefits the soul. Soil as well as soul. Understand this. Second, the bean field is a connecting link between the forest and the farmer's cultivated fields. Third, bird songs that Thoreau hears while planting, while farming, they add music to the harvest. And fourth, selling the beans will give him profit. Okay. After this, Thoreau philosophizes that New Englanders should cultivate not only beans, but also sincerity simplicity and justice. Imagine how he connects everyday things with spiritual things. I'm sure that is why Thoreau is a thorough transcendentalist, right? Nevertheless, Thoreau says, says that the sun shines just as strongly on the weeds or the wild, you know, plants and leaves that feed the birds, which means what is Thoreau trying to say here? Say here. Nature is impartial and omnipotent, right? Nature blesses everyone alike. In this essay, Thoreau compares himself to Antaeus, a mythical Greek giant who forced all passerby to wrestle with him, okay? Now, while farming, Thoreau spots many hawks. Remember, in the last essays also, I mentioned hawks. Hawks are mentioned often in Walden. He compares a hawk to the aerial brother of the wave, which he sails over. Imagine he's comparing a hawk to a wave. Just put the imagery in your mind. The hawk's air inflated wings reflect the rise and fall of the waves. Understood? These are hawk's wings and these are also waves. But Thoreau now tells us about a difference. He says that the hawk is free while the waves are unfledged pinions. What is unpledged pinion? Inexperienced wings that can't fly. Obviously, waves can't fly. A hawk can fly high. Thoreau says, now he compares himself to the waves. He says, Thoreau, me, just like these waves, I am unable to fly, but also I am pinned to the spot. At least the wave is moving. This Thoreau, he's just pinned. He's there at the spot. Why? Because he has beans to hoe. He has cultivation to do. Yes, here we are done with the seventh essay and we come to the eighth essay called The Village. A beautiful quote from The Village, listen. Not till we are lost in other words, not till we have lost the world, do we begin to find ourselves and realize where we are and the infinite extent of our relations. Did you understand? 
he says when i am lost in the world that is when i lose the world and enter my own world only then i understand how much possibility i have how much i am able to attain spiritually philosophically mentally yes you know the best company you can ever have in your life is yours yes i'm not saying please stop being a social animal no please interact with your family friends but meditate within yourself and that is what thoreau also says in this essay the village thoreau describes one particular day at walden after the morning chores he walks into concord and this was very very frequently okay it's not that he was always there in the forest he used to walk to his town remember it was not very far from walden pond so one you know day after doing the morning farming meditation walking in the woods he is going into the town concord here he observes the town's people he finds these town's people as oddities oddities mean strange or weird things and objects of study as unfamiliar as prairie dogs prairie dogs are these north american dogs okay the town according to thoreau resembles a great news room why because people are gossiping as efficiently as grain in a mill <laughs> now thoro says that i happily escape this news room or this town and i launch myself into the night for my snug harbor in the woods snug means comfortable so my comfortable home in the woods although thoro describes darkness as so thick that you could cut it with a knife remember there was not electricity i think it's 1850s we now we are completely surrounded by electricity but those were the times when it was very sparse right light was sparse people had to depend on natural light so thoreau says that darkness is so thick that you could cut it with a knife and also i have heard of many going astray even in the village streets which means people lose their way even in the villages during night yet Thoro knows the way to the woods by heart even in the darkest of the nights do you understand how familiar he has become with his this snug harbor in the woods that he can walk there without light without electricity just by his own instincts now he says on one particular trip into concord he is seized and put into jail by the officers why because he refuses to pay a poll tax after this he quotes wherever a man goes men will pursue and paw him with their dirty institutions what is this dirty institution it is the government and why is you know thoro calling the government as a dirty institution because he does not want to support this government which has still legalized slavery according to him a man cannot be held captive all men are free yes so he actually does not pay the poll tax he spends one night in the jail after that his friend releases him from the jail and it hardly matters to him okay he returns back to the woods thoro ends the essay the village by saying that he does not lock his door even at night because he feels so safe in the lap of nature unlike in the harmful state of concord <laughs> this takes us to the ninth essay called the ponds In this section Thoreau details the depth and dimension of the Walden Pond as well as his transcendental interaction with the pond okay listen he says the pond is a gem of the first water which concord wears in her coronet which means it is a brilliant gem gem of the first order means brilliant gem which concord because walden pond is near concord no so concord wears this walden pond as a brilliant gem in her coronet coronet is a crown for the pond's transparency thoro says it is like molten glass cooled but not congealed congealed means semi solid it is cool this water you know the pond's transparency it is like a glass cool but not semi solid look at the comparisons the beautiful imagery thoro is creating with his words yes thoro's cabin might be aloof but it is not lonely thoro often takes takes to fishing and plays his flute to the fishes who seem to appreciate the sound imagine he's fishing he's playing the flute and he feels that the fishes are really enjoying it night fishing is very exciting because thoro comes into contact with nocturnal fishes which had their dwelling 40 feet below 
Occasionally, Thoro walks to the hillside where huckleberries and blueberries grow. Enjoying the plucking, he notes, vulgar error to suppose that you have tasted huckleberries who never plucked them. He's saying that plucking is more, more charming than eating a fruit. You know, only when you pluck an apple, you will have the real beauty of eating it. Only when you pluck a huckleberry, you will have the real pleasure of eating it. If you don't pluck, oh, it is a vulgar error to suppose that you have tasted them. So cool. Thoro has moments of sadness now. Why? He discusses that how woodchoppers have decimated the forest around the Walden Pond and the Irish immigrants have built their sites by it. Okay, this is a time when people like Thoreau, I am saying he was a humanist, a naturalist, a transcendentalist, but then he was a man of his time. And during those times, the you know poorer whites were looked down by the rich whites or the intellectual whites. And actually, these Irish immigrants who were coming to America were looked down, okay? So he's saying that he's not really happy with the fact that the Irish immigrants have built their sites around the Walden Pond, which was one completely filled by forest. He's not agreeing to it, okay? So do you understand the difference here? Thoreau's love for Walden Pond makes it his spiritual home. This takes us to the 10th essay called Baker Farm. Essay begins by Thoreau comparing trees to shrines, which means places of worship. He calls holly berries or red colored berries and flowers too fair for the mortal taste, that is human's taste. Once while taking a walk into the woods, Thoro is caught in a shower that rages into a thunderstorm. So he cannot, you know, move towards his cabin because there's thunderstorms. So what happens? He takes shelter in a nearby hut. Whose hut is it? You should know it. An Irish man again. This hut belongs to an Irish American man named John Field who lives here with his family. And as the thunderstorm increases, Thoreau is sitting there, John Field starts sharing his family's miserable life with Thoreau. When Thoreau listens to it, he starts giving John Field a piece of advice. He says, he suggests Field to live like Thoreau, that is to avoid milk, meat and other luxuries, to work less so that he would not need any stout clothing. Rather, he could instead wear light shoes and thin clothing like Thoreau. If the fields like Thoreau, you know, they follow what Thoreau is saying, they would roam through the woods looking for huckleberries for their amusement. They would be happy. They would not have a miserable life. Thoreau points out then that I tried to help this Irish man with my experience, but the family seemed shiftless. As I told you, Thoreau was not too much in favor of these people. There, You know, it was that time when even there were job vacancies in America. At many places, it was written, Irish people don't apply for the jobs. Imagine, Irish immigration was a lot at this time. They were incapable people, according to Americans then. Okay, this is the history I'm talking about. So Thoreau says the same, that I tried to help him with my experience, but he did not listen. And also when he asks for water at John Field's house, he's given very dirty water, to which he says proudly that, you know, it's okay, I can have dirty water. He says that I'm not very squeamish or disgusted in such cases when manners are concerned. This takes us to the 11th essay called as Higher Laws higher laws above humanity. Let's listen. On return from John Field's hut, Thoreau spots a woodchuck. Who is a woodchuck? It's a rodent. And Thoreau is all of a sudden tempted to seize this woodchuck and devour him raw. Why? It is not for the taste of it because he wants to, you know, uh, take the wildness from that animal, not the taste. But he does not do it. Rather, he goes fishing. But now some change in Thoreau happens. He feels ashamed of eating fish as well. He comments that one should not disapprove of one's food and imagination and body should both sit down at the same table. You know, if my body is eating fish, my imagination should accept that I'm eating flesh. If they are not approving of each other, then it is not correct. So now a higher law or a higher understanding is entering Thoreau. He states that bread or potatoes are as sustaining as fish with less trouble and filth. So here that human conflict is shown. Yes, he's fighting. Till now he was eating fish, although he did not drink alcohol. 
he was a minimalist person but he was eating fish he enjoyed food but now he's contemplating should i even enjoy food no i have to survive food is a mode of survival not enjoyment enjoyment is beyond all this it should be beyond all this quote the wonder is how you and i can live this slimy beastly life eating and drinking as a transcendentalist thoreau wants to practice asceticism which is asceticism which is avoiding all forms of indulgence he says nature is hard to be overcome but she must be overcome note your nature is not you know the wild life nature is human nature so thoreau is saying that human nature is hard to overcome but it should be overcome he says that larvae okay larvae you know is the immature form in, of an insect larvae eats and eats and eats in fact it eats more than the adult form larvae eats more than a butterfly butterflies in fact just content themselves with a drop or two of honey or some other sweet liquid here and there so beautifully he's comparing so he's saying that the gross or unacceptable feeder is a man in the lava state who's eating 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 without thinking we should be butterfly we should be satisfied with just that one or two drops of honey understood deep meanings this takes us to the last essay of today called as brute neighbors brute neighbors begins with an imaginary dialogue between a hermit and a poet listen to this story The hermit is busy listening to the sounds around while the poet is rapturously looking up staring at the sky. The poet looks at the hermit and he says, "Oh, let me invite him for fishing." When he does it, the hermit directs him that to first go and dig worms as a bait. Bait you know is the food that we hook on that hook so that the fishes come and they get, you know, caught. So the poet goes and brings the worms and the two men depart for pond. okay for fishing so poet in fact does not even know the way it is the hermit who directs him in the earthly manner that this is where we have to go for fishing the poet's dreamy rapture over the sky is actually surpassed by the hermit's experiences on earth now why am i comparing it here is in this essay in brute neighbors you will actually find a comparison between earthly forms and divinity between earth and divine okay thoreau's story ends here and he begins to charmingly describe the various creatures he has met after moving to walden pond who are these creatures first a hand tamed wood mouse you know who you can tame who is very domestic whose tame nature is actually motivated more by hunger than by curiosity about thoreau second partridge chicks whose parents are killed by reckless hunters after which these chicks fall a prey to some prowling beast or bird third a feral or a wild cat and her kittens who spit angrily at thoreau this showcases wildness fourth a loon which is a large bird that eats fish who is a playmate in hide and seek games sometimes she's down the water up that's hide and seek no and also loon is a rain summoning spirit she calls rain fifth thoreau has spotted nesting birds a big otter and raccoons while staying at the walden pond and then thoreau says that people view animals bait worms and small boys as beast of burdens in a sense made to carry some portion of our thoughts imagine he's comparing even boys as beasts of burden then thoreau describes a fierce battle between two ant species and he says quote it was evident that their battle cry was conquer or die and these ants were fighting as viciously and violently as animals and they were suffering injuries also and in every creature in this chapter that i spoke about including the poet and the hermit divinity contrasts earthly existence and we are done with part 2 of walden in my next lecture we are going to do the third part which will cover the last six essays of walden novel if you loved it kindly subscribe to our channel and keep watching happy learning this is heena from team walad bye bye